This is Catherine Abdul Baki, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast, bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Catherine Abdul Baki. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, look over in the right-hand sidebar and subscribe to the show. It's free to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, now Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. That's hankgarner.com. I'd like to tell you about a few folks before we get into today's interview. Uh, Ernie Howard has a new book up for pre-order. It's called Melody 8. My mother used to sing to me when I was scared at night. She would lay beside me and I would place my head on her chest, hearing the song through the vibration of her body. I loved my mother's voice right up to the day she was put to death because of it. If you're a lover of post-apocalyptic stories, you need to get ready for a new twist on the genre. We must change the vibration or the frequency will forever change us. Melody 8. Pre-order it now from Ernie Howard. Soul Breaker by Clara Colson is free right now. There's a dangerous monster loose on the streets of Aurora, Michigan, and Detective Cal Kinsey is determined to stop it or die trying. Two years ago, Cal Kinsey was an up-and-coming cop in the Aurora Police Department, but during a fateful nighttime stakeout in search of a prolific killer, Cal witnessed the darkest corner of his dreams come to life. A rogue vampire slaughtered his partner and introduced Cal to the supernatural world he never knew existed in the shadows. Soul Breaker is free now from Clara Coulson. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also by August Anzel, After the Pretty Pox, The Attic. A searing act of bioterrorism, a catastrophic plague they call the Pretty Pox. Most of the human race is dead, and for two years, Ari McInnes has been alone, writing out the aftermath of the disease. Hidden in the attic of her ruined home, Ari survives by wit and skill, ritual and habit. Convinced that humans are little more than a dangerous fluke of nature, she chooses solitude, even in matters of life and death. Ari's precarious world is upended when her youngest brother, a man she's never met, appears out of nowhere with a badly injured woman. Their presence in the attic draws the attention of a dark watcher in the woods, and Ari is soon forced to choose between the narrow ideas that have sustained her and a stubborn instinct to love and protect. In book one of August Anzel's captivating post-apocalyptic series, After the Pretty Pox, cast an unwavering eye on what it means to be human in a world where nature has the upper hand, and the only rules left to live by, for good or ill, are the ones written on our hearts. After the Pretty Pox, The Attic. There's a link to it in the show notes. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Catherine Abdul-Baki on the show with me. Uh, she has a fantastic new book called A Marriage in Four Seasons, and I'm super excited to talk to you about it today. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Hank. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I think it started quite simply when I was around 11, and I asked my dad out of the blue what he thought I should be when I grew up. And he just uh, trying to take a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> I guess he tried to put me off and said, well, why don't you be a writer? Um, you can be a journalist just like your mother. And I had a, my mom passed away earlier, and um, maybe he was nostalgic, but that idea appealed to me. So that's basically he set the you know the little kernel right there. Yeah, uh, wow. So so your mom was a journalist. She trained as a journalist. Yes, she died very young. She wrote a few short stories and um, loved to write, uh, but I, she wasn't. You know, she never really it never came to fruition. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but but it sounds like she she left you a wonderful gift in the uh, uh, you know in that example that she set and 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 the storytelling gene maybe. 
She did, and in a sense, so she had her first uh, short story published in a major magazine at the age of 16. Oh, wow. So it was, yeah, very interesting, um, Amer- uh, an American magazine. I just, I came by it much uh, slower than she did. I, you know, discovered my talent through a lot of hard work. Let's sure. put it that way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I guess the idea, I always wanted to sort of become my mother, probably because she wasn't around. Uh, I might have been intimidated had she been around and had a writing career herself. But you, you know, you you never know. It's it's uh, the for some people the the example that someone close to us sets is invigorating and lights a fire, and and sometimes it feels like you're living in a shadow. It's uh, it's so strange how our reactions to those things are. So true. Um, what, what about your father? You, you know, it's, it's really interesting that, that he would say be a writer. Uh, was he, did, did you grow up in a bookish house? Uh, was there a lot of books around and was that important? Uh, there were a lot of books around. Both my parents read, though they read different things. My mother read a lot of fiction. My dad read more, you know, political things. And um, he was a businessman. But I think the reason he said at the time now, this was in the Middle East where I grew up, and my dad's an Arab with, with a very open mind. I think he thought it would be a practical career to have as a woman because I could be raising children and have a career. It wouldn't take me out of the home. And we're talking about the early 60s, so at times were a little different then. But when he said that, yeah, he said, you can this way you can, you know, you can raise a family and have your career. You don't have to sacrifice one or the other. And that idea appealed to me. Very pragmatic yet yet I forward pragmatic. thinking for the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you, you have a very interesting accent. You, you said that you grew up in the Middle East. Where exactly and, and what were the circumstances around? Uh, I, I think I read in your bio you, you, you grew up in several places throughout the Middle East. I did. I uh, My dad's an Arab. He's from Jerusalem, okay. a Palestinian. Okay. My mom's from Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> And they met in the U.S., um, but we went overseas when I was very young. I was about four years old. My dad was posted in various jobs, uh, first in Iran, in Tehran, then in Kuwait, where I spent a good 10 years. And then we moved to Lebanon and Jordan. So I've been all over those areas until I actually got married at the age of 19, um, and I came to mainland U.S. It was really the first time I ever lived here. So all my, my upbringing and my schooling, I went to American schools as well as Arabic schools. So I, I learned I'm bilingual and I, I went through two different curriculums. So uh, all, all of your formative years were, were in the Middle East. Uh, yeah. and And then coming to America uh, after you got married, uh, even though you have um, – half American lineage with your mother being from Nashville. Um, what was that experience like? Uh, was it culture shock? It was such a culture shock. <laughs> and I, and I'll tell you why, because interestingly enough, her parents who were from Nashville and very with very deep roots in Nashville, sure. picked up and moved to Honolulu when they reti- when my grandfather retired. Wow. And so all my trips to the U.S., we went on home leave every year. All my trips to the U.S. from Kuwait uh, were to Honolulu. Uh, so we would really only pass through the U.S. mainland on, you know, transiting to get back to Kuwait or to Honolulu. So the culture here was totally different. Um, of course, I spoke fluent English for the most part and um I had family here, you know, uh, extended family and an uncle in Philadelphia. So it wasn't all, you know, being dumped in a, an alien environment. But still, it was a big, uh, a big shock because it was totally different from anything I'd experienced growing up. Um. So, so let's fast forward a little bit. Where, what was the the idea that brought writing back to your mind? Uh, you, you've had this, uh, this this kernel planted by your father when you're young. You you've had all these amazing experiences living in uh, in another part of the world. Uh, you come to the U.S. Where does writing come back in? Well, I came to the U.S. after I'd finished my sophomore year of college, and okay. I had started to uh, want to be uh, study journalism. So I did one year of journalism overseas at the American University of Beirut. 
And when I was uh, um, accepted here at George Washington University, I continued with the journalism. So for all practical purposes, I was going to be a journalist. And I worked briefly as a journalist overseas when I went back with my husband on, on uh, an assignment he had and, uh, for his work. But then I decided that, you know, writing journalism uh, was not for me. I, I really wanted to stretch the truth here and there. And, <laughs> and, and uh, you can't do that as a journalist. I, I did a lot of features and hard news stories, but I really wanted to get into the mindset of, of people. And, and I guess in those days, now we're talking the 70s, um, you know, the journalism wasn't as creative as it is now. I mean, now it's much broader, but so I decided to do creative writing. And when I went back for my master's, I did it in creative writing. I, I love the, the way you, you phrase that, that uh, you were reporting, but you wanted to stretch the truth a little bit. And I, I think <laughs> in, in what you said there, I, I think what you're really getting at is you really wanted to explore maybe the reasons and the uh, the motivations behind things and and uh, uh, embellishing those things, which you, obviously you can't do in journalism. You've got to report the facts. But is that what intrigued you, really wanting to get behind what's going on in the story? Oh, absolutely, because I think as writers, um, we are really students of human nature. Right. And, and you know, uh, when we write something, we write about what, conflict, they say, and stuff, but it's basically human nature, and I wanted to see the reasons why people reacted to each other, to one another, to their surroundings the way they did. So you're absolutely right, for sure. Um, it wasn't enough just to report. I mean, that was really good training, because it trained my eye to see and uh, objectively, and right. so that was really good. But then, and it was kind of difficult, because in the beginning, when I started to write fiction, I really was doing a lot of reportage and description and stuff, you know, I'd done in journalism. And I really had to get away from that and get into the mindset of people, of course, which I'd been trained not to do. So that was itself a leap in a different direction. Um, I, we're, we're all studying human nature, uh, like you said, and I, I, I've talked about it a lot in when we're talking about uh, writing a different genre, uh, that, that someone might be telling a story that uh, is a science fiction story or a fantasy story or a horror story or a, uh, a historical fiction story. But, but those are just window dressings because what we're really doing uh, is telling stories uh, about about humans in relationship and how we uh, how we deal with one another and how we deal with the world around us uh, and I, I love that that you said we're we're studying human nature that that's really what storytelling is about no matter what kind of story you're telling absolutely because the reader has to relate to I think somebody in the story first right. of all it's not enough that you have a really great description of some place if the reader has no reaction to it we can't get involved. And um, even when you're writing from a, you know, a person of the opposite sex than you as a writer, you really have to get into their minds and into their hearts. And, and you're really writing about yourself, I guess, in the long run is what I want to say. So, sure. yeah, you're absolutely right. What, what types of stories did you begin telling? What were the things that, that first uh, uh, got you excited and, uh, and allowed you to open up your creativity? Well, when you First, when I first started writing, it was in grad school, and um, a lot of people in the class were extremely talented and were writing very sophisticated things that I thought were sort of like uh, John Updike and, you know, the people I'd love to read, Hemingway. So here I had no experience living in the U.S. I didn't have a voice of an American, and all I had were these stories that I'd grown up with in the Middle East. Um, uh, stories of things I'd seen, um, various stories that had been handed down to me. So I really felt very deficient in terms of subject matter, but I wrote out this short story for you know, a project in my writing class, and I was too afraid to even read it because, I mean, it was just so intimidating. <laughs> and the teacher who I, you know, just forever be thankful for, he actually read the story, and after he read it, uh, and this was about a woman, a village woman in a town on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. 
totally Arab mindset and Arab background. And actually, he, he asked the whole class to clap. Uh, I don't think, I think they liked it, it, you know, but it was so kind that they actually related to this story that, you know, was of a totally different background. And I think that just lit a spark in me. And I realized, oh, yeah, you know, people are the same everywhere. Right. Whether we're talking about Asia, Africa, the Middle East, uh, the United States. Uh, so that really opened my uh, mind to the fact that I could write my background. It, I didn't have to write like Updike or, you know, Joseph Heller or any of the other people I love to read. I could write me. So I really credit him with uh, giving me that confidence. Well, your books uh, often explore uh, these these ideas of uh, of Arab culture and Middle Eastern culture uh, juxtaposed on, uh, especially your new book is a is a very modern uh, literary work that kind of takes a turn and brings us into this other world and and and. Uh, uh, stories that uh, that most of us in in the West are, are not that familiar with. Um, when you started realizing that you could write your background, your history, your your culture, and and uh, and merge it into something new, um, was that liberating and freeing for you uh, to to l- find this new expression? It really was, and it didn't come right away. I wrote four books, one collection of stories and three other novels, all set in the Middle East. Um, One had, uh, the last one before this one, had uh, two American characters who go to the Middle East. But usually they were from the mindset of a Middle Easterner. But having lived here for so long, at some point I decided I need to get away from that. I've lived in the United States longer than I've lived in the Middle East. And I wanted to explore um, how Americans relate uh, to each other. But I also wanted to show how people react when faced with going to different locales. I start out in Spain and I take them to Turkey and to Tunisia and and how each of the different characters, the male and the female, the wife and the husband, relate. But it was comforting to kind of keep one foot planted in the Middle East. Um, And I took them to these places. But I wanted to get out of the Arab mindset and see how Americans might view other cultures. Well, so that, this was a real departure, as you say, for me. Excuse me. Yeah, no, no I, I was just going to – um, uh, and I want to talk specifically about a marriage in Four Seasons in just a minute. But I know a lot of your books have been taught uh, in universities, uh, you know, in multicultural studies and Arab studies. Um, what do you think – and and you've been in in the states for like you said longer than than you were there, um, so you really have this unique perspective of both sides. Uh, what do you think that people, uh, Americans specifically, or, or just Westerners in general, uh, maybe get wrong uh, about uh, Arab culture and uh, the the general um, uh, general life in the Middle East? You know, in in this world that we live in, things get get. Uh, condensed down to sound bites so much. And we, we see our, our opinions are shaped a lot of times by, um, you know, by, by things that we don't have any depth in. Uh, what do you think people get wrong about life uh, in the Middle East and in Arab culture? Well, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, with all the wars that have been going on in the last so many years, we we do only get those that part of the news, and so everything is violence and um, uh, you know the degradation of women and the, uh, sure. yeah. you know, dictators and all of this stuff. But actually, growing up in the Middle East was really peaceful, and and um, uh, we used to read about news in the U.S. and uh, and wonder you know how people actually managed to survive there with all this <laughs> crime and and uh, you know the race riots and. Right. The, uh, Stuff that were just really in the 60s and I guess early 70s. So actually, like anywhere else, the the Middle East is very varied. And from one country to another, from one social class to another in terms of economic, um, you know, uh, advantages. And everybody lives uh, like in the U.S. You know, if you go to New York City, 
it's going to be really different than if you go to a village in, say, you know, uh, Tennessee. I mean, there's, it's just so different. Right. So there's an American living here, an American living there, right? But um, they are very different in the way they act. Um, so the thing I think that I always like to point out is that, first of all, Arab women are, are very strong women. Um, that was one of the things I, I wrote about in my short stories, and I didn't intentionally do so. I wrote about the people I knew and the women I knew and, and made characters up from that. And, and it turns out I had written a book without realizing it about Arab women. So uh, the year was 1991, and it was during the Gulf War, and it was also the year of the woman that year. So I got a lot of invitations to go and speak on college campuses to classes who sometimes read my book and uh, to try and not dispel the stereotype, but to, it was cross-cultural literature and tried to show, you know, that people are all the same everywhere. So I think one thing um, that people don't realize here is that everywhere uh, people are the same. And if you go to the Middle East, you're going to find some people who are very liberated. I grew up in uh, some of the years I spent, for example, in Lebanon, people were wearing um, string bikinis. I mean, I was swimming in a bikini uh, growing up. When I got to Nashville, you know, I had uh, relatives there who never put on a bathing suit because they said, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be pleasing to Jesus. And right. So this was a. <laughs> and at the same time, they were asked, some of them, now these are all different people, some of my cousins were asking me how it was growing up in a culture that oppressed women. I mean, I never experienced that, you know, so I really couldn't answer to that. I mean, I just said, well, I, I, was, I was swimming, wearing my bathing suit. You know, Beirut is, of course, uh, very different, but um, most countries in the Middle East, you have, as I said, people of all different um, education levels, social backgrounds, and they're going to react, they're going to act according to how they were brought up and how they see the world. Um, this um, sort of religious um, sentiments that's sweeping everywhere, that was really not a big thing when I was in the Middle East at all. Religion was not in any way politicized. Um, so uh, this is sort of a new trend that's, I think, taking over, um, you know, nationalism, religion, all kinds of things, uh, ideologies taking over the whole world. It's not just in the Middle East. Right. And what you what you start to discover is that people all over the world really want the same things at their core. We we all want to be happy. We want to live in peace. We want to we want our kids to have a better life than we had. Uh, and if you can get past the news, um, you, you start realizing that that we all have way more in common than we have that separates us. You know, you are so right, and um, I think my mother found that out the first time she went to the Middle East. It was in the 50s, and she came from a lovely extended family in, in Tennessee, and when she went to meet my father's family, uh, they were another large, lovely extended, you know, family there, and really there were just, there was so so much similarity between her upbringing and his upbringing in that sense. Right. Um, so they sort of uh, was a, a mutual love affair between my mother and my father's family from the very start. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, Catherine, let's talk about the new book. The new book is called A Marriage in Four Seasons. We, we alluded to it a little bit a few minutes ago. Um, but tell us where this book starts. Who who are the characters that we meet? And uh, what was the original uh, motivation for this book? Well, I tell you, the original motivation was something so insignificant, uh, I never knew a novel would come out of it. Uh, my husband and I had been traveling in southern Spain, and we were alone for the first time. We didn't have children uh, around with us. We could do whatever we wanted. And I had really um, planned a trip to go to Granada in um, uh, southern Spain and to see the Alhambra. And I had been dying to do this for so long. But when we, uh, I booked a beautiful little hotel, very quaint Spanish hotel. And when we got to the hotel, uh, it was sort of like a big villa with a lovely garden. Everything was beautiful except the room was a, was terrible. It looked like a college dorm room. It was just so lacking in any kind of, it was like a Motel 6 kind of room. And I, I was shocked, you know, that this hotel that was so beautiful and this town that was so gorgeous and the Alhambra, 
and all the things that they could actually have a hotel room um, that was so unappealing. And for some reason, we couldn't change the room. I can't remember the reason. But here's the interesting thing. Although I was stewing and, and upset about the room, my husband had already laid down on the bed, took off the, taken off his shoes, and was happily watching a soccer game on the television. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yes. That's exactly, and I kept saying, well, aren't we going to try and change the room? And as I said, I can't remember. We couldn't for some reason. And I, I knew I should have you know, been more like him and more accepting, but I couldn't take the fact that you know, I was going to spend the next four days cooped up in this unappealing little room. Anyway, to make a long story short, we ended up enjoying the place, not the room, but the, you know, the town and the Alhambra. But when I got home uh, back to the U.S. and I started to write about it, I wanted there's something that so agitated me with that whole experience. I started to write what I thought was going to be a little travelogue, maybe to sell to a newspaper or something. It, again, took me into the realm of fiction. So I wrote a short story. And the short story involved, uh, like we had done, a woman and her husband arriving at this hotel room and her being so disappointed and he sort of being lackadaisical and going along with the um, unappealing surroundings. But that became the kernel of something larger, which was going to be their marriage. And this hotel room was going to start symbolizing uh, the you know the, the imprisonment she felt in her marriage. Uh, so this is really a little kernel of something so um, simple began to move into a a short story. And uh, as I kept writing the story, uh, it grew into a novel. So that is sort of the kernel of the story, as you as you said. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting. Um about this book and we, we mentioned it earlier is that we've got this, the story of a marriage, uh, and, and like you described it, uh, uh, joy is, uh, is, is not happy and we start seeing the cracks in this. Uh, but then, um, we've, the, the story kind of turns and we see this, uh, this introduction of the, uh, and, an old, um, uh, Arab story that that emerges and weaves into this. What what uh, what was your your um? Why did you choose to do that, and what did you hope to bring to the story with that? Well, um, what happens is the the man in the story, her husband, uh, remained a kind of a shallow figure, and all of the um, the. The critiques I got when I showed this story to various writer friends was that well, we like the story, but this guy is such um, such a drip. He's such a you know. Um, <laughs> why is she hanging around with somebody who is so unappealing and he's so kind of a stick in the mud? So I tried to fix him to make him more appealing, and eventually, what I had to do was actually step into his shoes and write a whole chapter from his point of view. Once I did that, I find I found that he was not only telling his side of his story with joy, but he was actually embarking on his own adventure. So I followed him on this adventure. And this adventure essentially took him into the arms of another woman. And um, so then I had to, to write about Joy's reaction to that Um situation. So eventually what happened is the reason this, um, it's really a universal story of, you know, um, a, a man having an extramarital affair and his wife finding out and they sort of separate, but they, part of the story then moves to Turkey. I show them in Spain and then I show them back in New York and then I move them to Turkey because Somehow she wants to travel in the Middle East, and he decides he wants to get back into the marriage, so he follows her to Turkey. And essentially they end up in North Africa, in Tunisia, because 
the other woman whom he loved is essentially there. I don't want to give away too much of the story. Sure, sure. But that's where the Middle Eastern part comes in because I wanted each country um, to show a different side of their marriage. For example, Spain in the beginning shows her desire to um, get pregnant, to have a romantic relationship with her husband. They go back to New York and he has his affair. Her marriage is breaking up. You know, so the coldness of New York kind of um, brings that about. Um, in Turkey, which has always been a crossroads of civilization, she has to make major decisions. You know, is she going to take a second look at her husband or not? And then the, this balmy kind of um, gentle uh, North African uh, Tunisian atmosphere is when she decides how she's going to settle and, you know, uh, come to terms with her life. So in that sense, it does end up in the Middle East. But the story is more or less a universal story of, of a marriage. You, you've got uh, the, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, how place almost becomes a character uh, in a book sometimes when, when you anchor a story uh, in a very specific place with a specific culture and specific people. Um, but I love the way that the, your choice of place in the book really, um, uh, mimics and, and informs their relationship. Um, at what point in the, in the writing did these different locations, uh, when did you realize, oh, this is, uh, this is going to be a great narrative tool? Uh, was it something you thought about from the beginning or did it just come about in the telling of the story? I think it came about in the telling of the story. And then once I realized that that's what was happening, I then started to maybe embellish a little on that. But basically, when I took them to Spain, I just wanted them <clears throat> to have a, a nice little time in Spain and this hotel room that's going to make their marriage kind of show us the fissures, the cracks in their marriage. Um, but uh, when they go to Tunisia, I, I, I started to write about, you know, the various um the ruins and the, the beaches and all that, but it's a, they're in a more mellow time of their life. Turkey uh, is, is much more, you know, as I said, the crossroads of civilization. She has choices, which way is she going to go? And so I bring out what I think in Turkey are a lot of conflicts. You know, Turkey is sort of a, a, an Eastern country for sure. It's also a very Western country. Part of it is in Europe. And you have the Turks who look very Western and Turks who look very Middle Eastern. So this is the way she had a big choice there, which way she was going to go. And um, New York, of course, is New York, but it's it's also busy and it's also it can be cold and it can be impersonal. And so that was where I, I chose to have her marriage kind of breaking apart. And I think it, it starts kind of just intuitively, uh, but then from there it expands. You have, when, once you realize that, then you can draw in other little things and, and, and heighten that tension or that feeling. Um, when you're when you're describing these different settings, uh, what what are some tools that you use, uh, and 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 are they informed by your time as a journalist? I, I guess is a good question to ask. Um, but how do you? Um, how do you pick the things that you describe uh, that brings the reader uh, there to that location with you? I think I just draw on memories of what I had seen there that affected me there. Right. Um, that sort of comes from, I don't know that I choose, but I little things here and there that I experienced. And then from there I go on and do maybe a little research and maybe uh, draw in more. Uh, for example, in Turkey, um, you know, there's the beautiful blue mosque with these chandeliers. It's very uh, soft lit, softly lit. Um, so that sort of is, is an idea of worshipers go in there. It's very mellow, very spiritual. So she has this mellow feeling uh, of that mosque, the blue mosque, whereas when she goes into the Hagia Sophia, you know, which once was a cathedral that was turned into a mosque at some point, uh, there is this dichotomy. You know, you have the remains of the Christian uh, naves of the Christian church, 
and you have uh, the later Islamic additions, and so that's that sort of becomes her her tug of war. You know, what is she? Is she a married woman, a single woman? You know, you kind of draw in little details, and then you sort of relate them to her psyche. Right. Uh, if you if you describe a little a beautiful little alleyway, for example, that has a lot of character and whatever, it'll be much more effective if you after you enjoy describing that, you kind of relate it back to her. You know, how, what does it reflect in her? And I, I had to learn to do this, uh, that it wasn't enough just to write beautiful description um, or write description of a place I considered beautiful, but to show how it related to her. You know, was it confusing? Was her mind confused? Just like this narrow alleyway, that kind of thing. Those are little tools you, of the trade that you learn as, as you go along. And that's what really separates uh, a, a travel log uh, with with personal experience from uh, a novel set in a place where we're really getting the the emotional connection to the place and, and what, what feelings it elicits in, in being there, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, what, what we see and hear and, uh, and a, a story trying to, uh, you know, almost, uh, convince people to visit there. That, that's where the separation comes in. It's that emotional connection. You're right. Um, although I, I will say I read a lot of great uh, journalistic travelogues that sure. uh, that you know give me a lot of that insight. But you go a step further in fiction, and I think part of the fun for me was trying to, um, in a way, it was bashing stereotypes, but at the same time, uh, it was trying to show how different people react once you take them out of their familiar uh, comfort zone, you know, like the husband when he goes to Turkey, I mean, he sees the negative stuff first. And he, he's not a bad man, he just, um, or negative man, he just, this is what maybe the male character sees, or, or maybe him, and she's always coming down on him and saying, you know, why are you so looking at things from only your perspective? Why don't you try and accept their perspective? So this was fun to do, because... Um, in my experience, um, women are always a little more open to new possibilities. I, I won't say always, but often uh, when it comes to a couple. Um, and I'd seen a lot of, say, um, expat Americans and British and how they would react to the quote-unquote local people. <laughs> uh, and, and so I brought a little up of that here and there, uh, just for fun. Uh, because it is, and I'm, you know, Middle Easterners, when they come here, it's the same. I mean... A lot of people come to New York and they're terrified because all they see is smoke coming out of the grate. They see, you know, they, they hear about guns everywhere. They're, they're very, very scared. So, you know, that's another thing they have to dispel is their own prejudices about the United States. So that was fun. That was fun to do. Well, Catherine, the, the new book of Marriage in Four Seasons uh, is out everywhere now. Uh, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, if people are just discovering you and your work, uh, is there a place where they could find you online to learn more about you? They certainly can. My website has all the lists of my other books, which are all available on Amazon. And uh, I think this is the one that's available on Kindle right away as well, The Marriage in Four Seasons. But my website is simply katherineabdulbaki.com, and uh, that that will lead them directly to um, my website. I also have an author page on Amazon that has lists all my books. Great. We're going to put a link to your website and uh, to A Marriage in Four Seasons in the show notes. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for uh, taking time to come on the show with us today. Oh, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Great pleasure. Writing novels is hard, but Dabble makes it easier. Dabble replaces your word processor doing what it can't. Dabble organizes your manuscript, story notes, and plot. It simplifies story, leaving more room in your brain to create. And after all, that is what being a writer is all about. Dabble was built from the ground up specifically for writing novels. It takes minutes to learn, and it makes writing a joy. See how Dabble will revolutionize the way you write with a free trial at www.dabblewriter.com. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com, and when you're there, please subscribe. 
Up next is an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Seven men ran the farce. The seven witch hunters. The court of Oyer and Terminer. They tortured and lied and mutilated and murdered. They knew those women up in Salem Village were no witches. Their true target was the coven hidden in their own midst here in Salem Town. They meant to hang the innocent until the sisters surrendered. Did they surrender? said Jason. No. Was that the wrong decision? To let innocent women die and save themselves? What do you think? Should the coven have fought openly? Created more hysteria by swooping in on broomsticks and casting spells over Salem? Should they have killed the judges? There are no right decisions. That is the horror of a witch hunt. Everything you do condemns you. Question the judge, thou art a defiant witch. Question his laws, you question the king, and thou art a treasonous witch. Question his superstitions, you question scripture, and thou art a blasphemous witch. Pity the condemned, you pity witches, and thy Christian mercy proves thy collusion with Satan. Witch hunters are not just bad lawyers practicing bad law. They are men who place the ends before the means. They choose their victim, a man, a woman, an entire race, and mark them for extinction. All evidence is damning evidence. All associations are damning associations. All infractions, and who among us is without sin, are unforgivable infractions. Their own failings and abuses of power are shrugged away as mere vigor in pursuit of the public good. A witch hunter will have you by whatever means necessary. If he cannot find evidence, he will create evidence. He will entrap you and question you and distort what you say. He will walk you through the night until your feet bleed, strip you and stripe you, dress you in your own filth until you forget you are human. He will torture your friends until they betray you. And if anyone dares to weep at your hanging, he will drag them to Gallows Hill in the back of the next ox cart. Any man can be a witch hunter. All it takes is hatred and arrogance and the preening self-regard that proclaims my deeds are always good because they are my deeds. The seven judges of the Salem court were such men. But one witch stood up to them. She stood up to centuries of unchallenged, murderous dogma and pronounced the magic word, no. They burned her for it. 